Okay, so our first uh, presentation is about the, the paper um, opening the black box of deep, deep neural network uh, via information theory. So, and presenter is um, Sam Stiefman. Go ahead, go ahead, Sam. All right. So Vitaly already said what the paper is about. So I'm just gonna get started. So we first need a few preliminaries from information theory, the concepts of entropy, mutual information, Markov chains, and the information bottleneck bound. And I'll cover those and then get more into their application to the neural networks. So entropy, well, to start off for in information theory, you consider systems, probability systems, which are a set of states and each state has a probability. Entropy is a measure of the randomness of a system. So if a system is completely deterministic, it has zero entropy. Mutual information is a measure of how much information two systems can have about each other. Um, and it's defined below. So the entropy is, it's an integral if it's a continuous system, but it's a sum if it's discrete. Um, yeah. And the mutual information, just like a few notes about it, because it's a conditional probability. Um, if the systems are the same, the conditional probability is a regular probability. Um, actually, sorry. If the systems are the exact same, so if Y is all the information about the system X, then that entropy will be zero because it's a deterministic system. If we already know what happens in a probabilistic system, it's not no longer probabilistic. So you get that the inf mutual information is bounded by the entropy. So just like if you don't know, entropy is measured in bits. Usually the logarithm used is base two. If you have n coin flips and you're just looking at all the possible configurations, you get n bits of entropy. Um, so for this paper, they used feed forward neural networks, which as we've discussed, have a very specific structure. Um, and a certain number of layers up to seven in this paper. They use stochastic gradient descent, which underlies some of the results. They used Arctan as their activation function and all the networks were fully connected. And for the data, all of the data was generated by the authors based on specific real valued functions. And they use some randomness in the generation process. So it's not like tested on MNIST or some real data set. And for the rest of this presentation, the data, the letter X will denote input data and Y will be the labels. So the goal is to predict the labels Y based on the input data X. So there's a couple more properties of mutual information that are important. One of them is that if the two systems are independent, they don't have any information about each other. That like intuitively makes sense. You wouldn't expect to be able to predict something from something else if they're independent. If you have invertible functions, the mutual information is invariant under, under transformations by the invertible functions. So invertible functions don't create or get rid of information about the systems. It also makes sense. And one of the important parts of that is it means that the mutual information is independent on how you train your data. So, or the order of how you train your data. So if you have the same set of data, it doesn't matter the order because that's a, um, it's, it's an invertible transformation. You can always rearrange the order however you want and recover the original ordering. Um, so Markov chain is the other concept we need. And that's a probabilistic process in that it gives you probabilities of going between different states. Um, and it's usually represented uh, so, by a graph. Uh, Sam, can I ask you a question? So you, yeah. you mentioned the order. Uh, uh, so the, the probability distribution they're talking about here is not connected to neural networks yet. It is just, uh, you have two random variables, X and Y, uh, now, I understood your statement when you say that if Y is just a function of X, which is invertible, then there isn't new information uh, in, in Y. 
uh, once you know X. But I can, didn't quite understand the, your statement about uh, reordering. Uh, so can you can you oh, yeah elaborate? So on? yeah, it, like you said, if Y is a function of X, you don't gain new information. But also if you have in, in you invert know, in, invertible function of X, right? Yeah, invertible. Yeah, yeah. If you already know the information of X and Y, and you take an invertible function of X, that is the same information. So mm -hmm. an invertible function on any of them doesn't change the information. Mm -hmm. And if you're just reordering or relabeling like what you call data point one or data point two or whatever, um, state one, state two, that's an invertible transformation and doesn't affect the uh, information. Oh, uh, reordering of data, uh, the, the random variable. Reordering of states, I meant uh, not yeah, the data. Yeah, sure, sure, got it. Mm -hmm. And of course in a neural network, because you're doing gradient descent and training, reordering the train data will affect it. Sure. But it's more that if you like change the order of the, the neurons or like mm -hmm. their labels, it's not yeah. gonna- So I think you're talking about permutation invariance. So if you yeah. permute uh, given variables, then there's not, going to be any changes in the mutual information or, or in information or entry. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So then Markov chains, they're not invertible transformations, but because they only rely, the pro transition probabilities, as they're called, only depend on the current states, not on where, like the sort of path you take to get to the current state they can reduce the information. So if we have this Markov chain here where X goes to Y goes to Z, um, the information between X and Y is gonna be greater than the information between Y and Z because the Markov chain just, it's not gonna add any information going from Y to Z. Uh, Sam, I think you misspoke. What you meant to say is information between X and Y is greater than information between X and Z, not Y. Yeah, that's what I meant, sorry. Yeah, it's greater than X and Z. Y and Z could be much higher sure. um, depending on the system because they could have perfect information between the two. So now the neural networks, as I mentioned, are feed forward, fully connected neural networks. Um, in this diagram, the output layer is y hat so that's what's actually predicted by the network and y is what we want to predict so y is actually shown as like a, another piece of the data um the hidden layers are all labeled with t with like ti for the i layer and we're considering the neural network as encoding the data into the hidden layers and then decoding the labels from the hidden layers um, and because of that, that's, or sorry, that's, because of that, that's sort of like what we need because we don't care really about what the hidden layers are. We just care about how they store the information and how we can retrieve the information from them. Um, and from that inequality I showed earlier with the Markov chains, the authors have derived a much longer chain of inequalities where they're able to bound the information about the labels. Um, sorry, yeah, the information about the labels from the outputs based on the information about the labels from the full data. And that makes sense because a neural network doesn't create new information. It can only use information that's already in the data. So the output neurons aren't going to have anything new. They can only have less information about the labels, but ideally they contain all the relevant information. All right, yeah. And as I mentioned, I think we want to maximize the information about the labels contained in the hidden layers. We want to minimize the information contained in the hidden layers about from the data. Uh, sorry, Sam, I interrupt you again. Uh, so they assume that the transformation from layer to another layer is invertible, right? No, we're assuming it's not. So I mean, it's not, okay. Because you're using some sort of nonlinear activation function. Sure, exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, then you would have equality, not inequality, and it wouldn't be as useful. So that leads to an optimization problem 
um, called the information bottleneck method um, that gives, in this specific case, a bound that looks like this, that they tested against some of the neural networks and they were found within error to meet the bound. Um, and it's a complicated optimization problem because you're optimizing over probability distributions and the probability distributions themselves are not simple. They depend on data and you have, you might have many layers, you might have many neurons. It's, and the sort of space of possible values, like the weights of the weight matrix can have anything in the real numbers. So you have really large spaces of values and really complicated probability distributions. And they have more details in the paper about how they actually worked with this optimization problem. Um, so now one of the interesting insights of the paper is this visualization technique of the neural networks using the mutual information. So as I mentioned, you have this desire to maximize the information contained in the network on the labels. So they plotted that as the y-axis and then you kind of want to minimize or bound it with the information contained in the network about the input data. And in this first graph on, graph on the left, each point is actually a different neural network and each color represents a layer. So on the left, you have the first layer and you have 50 different neural networks and each one has, uh, yeah, so each point. So you don't, you lose in these graphs the information about individual layers, but we're able to look at as a whole how the, or sorry, individual neural networks, but as a whole, how their layers change. And in this first graph, again, the first- uh, Sam, you can use your yeah. uh, pointer. I okay. Mean, it would be easier for us yeah. to- So the first window is the initial randomized weights. So how much information was contained based on these initial weights. Um, you then have after 400 epochs and then after 9,000 epochs. And there are two things that are, I think, interesting about this visualization. And the first is that the information about the label that we want to maximize has gone up. You like, not uniformly, but it's gone up in every layer. So even the early layers gained information about the label. But another thing we see is that you do see the information about the input data decreasing. And you see this from really looking between the second and third windows that a lot of these points bunch up to the right-hand side of the graph and then they go up, but they also go left and the green, the final layer spreads out. So it loses a lot of this information. And that's one of the big sort of ideas of this paper is this loss of information about the data because it leads to more efficient encoding or representation. This graph uh, on the- In a more appropriate yeah. way to say, it, uh, you're getting rid of irrelevant information in the input layer, uh, yet, uh, uh, keep the, the relevant information, which is also in input layer, but it also in the in, in the label and output layer. Uh, so if you had very little of the irrelevant information, then you wouldn't probably see that trend of decreasing information. But since usually uh, the data input data do contain lots of irrelevant information, that that's why you know most of it just just uh, goes away. The strain, yeah. That's exactly right. Um... So then this graph on the right shows the effect of the training data. So in, this is like a, a very different structure of a graph where they take the neural networks and the color represents instead of the layer, it represent, re, represents the epochs and the points represent the layers. So we see that on the left, when 5% of the data, like the available data is used to train the model, much less information about the labels learned, especially in the early layers. Whereas when closer to 85% of the data is used, much more information is learned. And that's not 
anything that should be surprising that more data leads to more information about the labels, but it's just an interesting visualization technique to show it's that it works. All right. So as I mentioned, um, they sort of conjecture in this paper, these two phases. The first is a fast learning phase. And that's what we saw at the beginning where the points go up initially, but there's also this, and the information increases, but there's also this slow forgetting phase where you lose the irrelevant information as Vitaly said. And they also conjecture in this paper that this comes from the stochastic gradient descent that they used. And that specific part of it has actually been debated among other researchers. So there have been researchers that have said it doesn't come from stochastic gradient descent, it comes from geometric effects. There are other researchers that say this doesn't work if you don't use arctan activation um, and other researchers who have refuted those claims. So it's not, this is, um, this isn't as established as those information plane visualizations, which aren't just like visualizations. Right. And so Sam, would, they, would the authors of this paper say that uh, if you use just normal gradient descent, then uh, they would not be uh, forgetting the irrelevant information? I, I'm just trying to understand what, what's, uh, yeah. what's their take on that. I think so, at least from reading just this paper. They okay. have, they've released, of course, more papers. Um, I'm not sure if there have been follow-up papers, but I know like establishing the information bottleneck bound was a previous paper. So I'm not sure if their opinions have changed, but yeah, from the paper, it seems that they're saying that this is because of the stochastic gradient descent, yeah. those two phases at least. Mm -hmm. All right, and then here's some of their evidence for those two phases. I'm actually gonna start with this graph on the right. This is the, based on the neural networks that they used in the, for the rest of the paper. And the one on the left is a different structure of a neural network. Um, and essentially what they did is they plotted over for each epoch, the magnitude of the gradient that they use in the gradient descent and the standard deviation of the gradient. And we see that about at about 350 epochs, the standard deviation overtakes the gradient, or sorry, overtakes them, the, the magnitude of the standard deviation overtakes the magnitude of the mean. And because of that, they argue that the gradient descent is going to follow a diffusion process, which is a process that's governed primarily by the by randomness. So you don't know if it's going to increase or decrease or whatever. And that's and then they use the Pocker Flank or sorry, Fokker Planck uh, equation and some other ideas about diffusion equations to argue this point that it actually helps with the optimization. And then on the left is the same graph, but with a different neural network. And in this, you do see the same overtaking of the standard deviation and the mean, but you also see a different effect at the end of the network, which I honestly don't know why that happens in this one versus the other. But uh, uh, so what was the reason for them not to use uh, Fokker-Planck equation all the way through? Because like initially you have this drift uh, towards the minima, and then you have, you're saying that at late times, it mostly the stochasticity, the diffusion part deviates. Of course, Fokker-Planck equation has both terms. It has the, the drift term, and then it has uh, a, a diffusion term. Uh, so then, you can describe the whole evolution with, with the very same uh, equation if, if, if you want. But, uh... okay. Yeah, I actually don't know much about the Fokker Planck okay. equation. Okay. So I'm not sure they might have used it the whole way. I but I think it's not necessary at the earlier parts, maybe. It's more necessary. Yeah, the earlier part diffusion parts. doesn't matter, right? It, it yeah. rolls down. Uh, it's like you have two terms in the equation. One is subdominant, the other is dominant. And then they all come become of the same order. And maybe the other one even becomes smaller because you 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 know by by randomness you get it to a better uh, minimum. But but yeah, I think you can use it throughout. Okay, okay thanks. Nice have slide. They also tested 
the effect of the training data and the number of hidden layers, because they want to ask the one of the big questions in neural networks is why is more hidden layers good? And not just why is more hidden layers good, but how many hidden layers do you need for a specific problem and why? Because mm -hmm. um, there is a universal approximation theorem that says like you can approximate basically any function if you have enough hidden layers, but there's no good way to know how many. Mm -hmm. So they use these with similar plots earlier just to show how their networks trained faster and better when they had five or six hidden layers versus one. And this plot on the right is a new style of plot. So each of these, each line is its own neural network and they're all converged neural networks. I'm not 100% sure what they mean there, whether that's after 9,000 epochs or a different stopping condition, but these are neural networks that have been trained. And they looked at those networks information based on how much of the training data they used. So of course the network that only had 4% of the training data used learned way less information in the hidden layers than the network that had 84%. Yeah. And that's my presentation. Perfect. Thanks, Sam. Uh, questions? I hate to be the only one who asks questions. So, uh, people, oh, there, there is one in the chat. Um, you can speak up if you if you like. A bit and... Sure. Yeah. Uh, I guess. I so I remember reading a paper a long time ago, and I could, and now I was curious. What is the role of the trade-off parameter in this particular problem? Do you mean like the beta, the Lagrange multiplier? Correct. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Honestly, I'm not sure. That's one of the parts that I didn't dive into as much was the optimization uh, okay. from that bound. Yeah, but but I think it uh, what they say here is that you want to uh, uh, minimize the irrelevant information and maximize the relevant information. And so beta would be, uh, you know, uh, you know, by how much do you think that uh, irrelevant information uh, maximization of irrelevant information is more important than minimization of irrelevant information. And, and then... Well, I, I would have said that there's like one condition in which, uh, you know, you actually just memorize the entire data set perfectly, and that would be the limit in which beta is set to zero, right? So I guess what I'm trying to get at is like... Oh, it's the other way around. Result... I, I think it's the better equals uh, in, in infinity. Infinity, yeah, sorry. Be sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I, I write it the other way usually, that's all. Uh, <laughs> um, no, but uh, I guess what I'm trying to get at is what if there's a condition that this is very dependent on the size of the size of the hidden layers they go through? And if you were to rewrite the problem such that instead of bottlenecking in, certain, in terms of hidden layers, you actually make each of the hidden layers larger than the input set and then, then write the classifier on the last layer or something like that, then you don't have compression at all, right? Uh, so I, I'm not sure I completely understand. Sorry, Sam, you will probably say what you have to say, but I think it's a really interesting idea. Maybe what you're saying that uh, let's put other constraints. And let's uh, try to see what are other uh, uh, things we can derive from this variational principle, like putting more layers, uh, having uh, maybe a specified number of layers, having a specified width of layers, etc. Now, in a variational problem, they all will all those constraints will appear as additional terms and as additional uh, Lagrange multipliers uh, for solving the variational problem. Uh, but, I, but I think that the, I, I also read this paper a long time ago, but I think the, the claim was that this minimization, extremization happens automatically uh, in, in the deep neural network. And so uh, if, you, if you do not constrain anything, like you don't put the number of layers or anything, that, then th this is what, what it should be. There's just two terms that are uh, fighting with which one another. Uh, but if you do put other constraints, there will be other terms that will be uh, in this uh, trade-off uh, idea. But maybe you ask something else, and then maybe Sam has something else to, to chip in here. Um, I don't really have anything else to say, I guess. Mostly that, yeah, exactly what you said. Uh, I think they argue that the optimization is automatic. Yeah. And it's I like guess what I really need structure. to ask is like, 
uh, beta seems to be an implicit parameter of the neural network somewhere. And I want to know. Oh, no, what... no, 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 no. It's a Lagrange multiplier. It's not, uh, it, it's not the parameter. Uh, well, yeah. uh, you, you, in order to like, in order to find out whether or not you saturate this bound, right. You have to, you, the, the, the saturation of the bound depends upon your trade-off parameter. Yeah. Uh, well, okay. Well, I mean, some may say something to this. This is not how I understood uh, the, the, this this problem. Okay. Maybe maybe I need to think about it a little bit more too. Yeah, okay. so to my, my take on it, right? So let me just how I, I treat it. So beta is as a parameter. It's a parameter not describe uh, describes the uh, actual neural network. Uh, it's a Lagrange multiplier that, that describes a state of a neural network. Uh, think about beta that appears in in uh, statistical uh, mechanics and thermodynamics. Right, it's one over uh, one one over temperature. So it 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 is described the state to how 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 uh, to which you are, you uh, kind of um, converged to uh, during the learning process. And, and so this variational principle, as it's set up here, is not going to determine beta for you at all. Now, usually you would also vary uh, minimize with respect, you know, vary with respect to beta, uh, and then that would actually. Uh, if you vary this with respect to beta, what it tells you that uh, that you know i uh, t comma y has to be zero. That's the variation. Now maybe you're not gonna get uh, zero. Uh, maybe you have some uh, idea in mind of what this mutual information uh, should be, and then you put it uh, as another term beta times that number, and then varying with respect to beta would basically give you a an equation that i t comma y equals to that number. And that's how it at least happens in statistical mechanics. And then beta does becomes uh, a variable in the variational problem. Here it, it isn't. So the, here they like kind of, we don't know what it is, but I think we think that the, uh, like we we'll find it experimentally, right? Uh, uh, you know, do, do the run, uh, calculate uh, i x comma t, then calculate i t comma y, uh, find the ratio, and that's your beta. Now, if you run your neural network longer, you'll have a different beta. So that, that's my understanding. Uh, it's like more phenomenological where we think there is a beta, but we don't know what it is. And I think that's what they did here is they found the beta for the neural network. Yeah, exactly. And it changes, right? So as you yeah. see, with, with uh, so, I, I, so what, which way does the time flow from left to right? Or I don't think it does in this. I think these are different networks. Oh, oh, different networks. Sure. Okay, fine. I think the but points they also, converge to the bound. Right, right. Yeah, but you you, you also saw, showed um, um, plots where this line kind of was going up, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay, great. These so plots. beta is just the slope. That's right. Okay, fine. So as you see, beta is just the slope. And so the slope becomes uh, kind of largest uh, on top. So, so this corresponds to the largest beta, smallest temperature, effective temperature, what I call like temperature of a learning system. It is a, a, a similar to, to that. Uh, yeah. Other questions? There's another oh, question uh, in the chat. Okay. Oh uh, Yeah, so my question is, uh, how do you see overfitting from this these pictures? Like, does it mean lots of the green dots or the entire picture is just about green dots or you have everything to the right of the picture or the graph? So the overfitting in these graphs are sort of the, like, that's part of the idea of losing information, you, losing irrelevant information is that it's to, partially to prevent overfitting. So that's what we see when the dots move further left. At least that's my understanding of it, is that mm -hmm. that's part of the reduction of overfitting. Because you learn the labels, not the data, is the idea. Okay, I see. So if, if the neural network has learned too well, then the green dots will be all, all over, uh, all the way to the left, I guess. Well, if it's learned the data too well, all the dots will be all the way to the right. Even like the early layers will know too much information mm -hmm. about the data. Yeah, but maybe we are not able to uh, actually uh, pinpoint that, that this network is overfitting just by looking at those graphs. I mean, yeah. the general tendency, yeah, will be to the left if it does overfit, but we cannot say whether this network overfitted just by looking at these plots. All right, I see. Thank you. 
Okay. Uh, hi, Sam. I have an additional question. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, like, uh, uh, like in machine learning, we sometimes use uh, techniques uh, for like input compression. Maybe sometimes principal component analysis, where you uh, only take the components that explain, uh, say, ninety five percent of the variance of the data. So, like, does that uh, correspond to say how much percentage of mutual information? that we're willing to take in the input? Is there a connection between the, let's say, uh, that variance approach and this entropy approach? I don't know, because I don't know that much information theory, but I'm guessing there is, because they're both based on the probabilistic properties. Yeah, I, of I, I think that the, the, main, the, the main difference is in the, when you remove irrelevant information, by doing principal component analysis, you have a pre-described techniques of how to do that. So this is kind of pre-trained network. You can think about this that get rid of some information in a predetermined way. Here they say, all right, let's not help neural network. Let it itself figure out what is irrelevant or not. So yeah, at I the see. end of the day, both will get rid of irrelevant information. And of course, if you know how to get rid of, you are in a better position, right? Because you 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 don't have to train everything. Um, but but here they are just saying like let's let's network figure out it and, and and maybe there is an underlying principle of how that happens if the neural neural network is deep and that's what the bottleneck ID is. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Okay, so let me. Thank you, Sam. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>